Good evening, everybody, and welcome to St. Andrews on the Terrace. I'm very pleased to be able to greet you all here on behalf of the St. Andrews Trust for the Study of Religions and Society, and Reverend Dr. Margaret Mayman, who is the uh, Minister, Minister of the Church. Excuse me. Um, the theme that the Trust has chosen for 2012 is Shaking the Foundations. Uh, I'm sure you've worked out that this is all to do with Christchurch and how the terrible events in Christchurch have shaken our perception of the world <clears throat> right away to the foundations. Now, Stephen Batchelor has been shaking the foundations of the Buddhist community now for a good many decades. Um, if you want to read his biography, it's on um, many websites and uh, inf information. Uh, there's much information about him. I think what I'd like to mention is that he's really dedicated his life to the study of the Buddhist teachings and the practice of these teachings. And not just one particular facet of them, but many facets really in an attempt to get a handle on what's relevant for us in this period now. And um, I think that's really going to be largely the focus of his talk, which he titled, Being Completely Human, Buddhist Practice in a Post-Christian World. So I'd like to welcome Stephen to Wellington, to New Zealand, and uh, say over to you. Um, thank you very much, Ramsey, and thank you very much the St. Andrew's Trust for uh, hosting this event. Um, we have a logistical problem. There are many people who think this begins in 20 minutes. <laughs> so um, I don't quite know what we're going to do about that. Maybe they won't come. <laughs> but to... Sorry? The traffic is bad. Well, um, what I thought might be an idea would be to begin, uh, in other words, to allow 10 or 15 minutes or so uh, for latecomers to arrive, and in that period to just sit quietly, or stand quietly, or lie on the floor quietly. And um, you can call that meditation if you wish. But just to become aware of where you are in your life, what is bubbling up in your mind, how you feel physically, emotionally, and as a, a focus for your attention, just become aware of the, the natural in, inflow and outflow of your breath. Very, very simple exercise. And if you get distracted, if the mind wanders off into some memory or into some plan or some associated stream of thinking, then just gently come back to the feeling of your body, the rhythm of the breath, which is a sort of primary rhythm of our life, really. Our primary connection with the world in which we live. Okay, so I'll begin now. I'm not aware of uh, who most of you are. I realize there are people here who come from a Buddhist background, others from a Christian background, and possibly others who would not identify with either or with something else. So I'll speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then I'd like to open up the room to, um, for, for you, for questions and comments and reflections. 
So the subtitle of this talk is Buddhist Practice in a Post-Christian World. This idea of, um, of post-Christianity, or we might even say post-Buddhism, as we also use the expression post-modernity, is rather ambiguous in a way. If it really does refer to something after Christianity or after Buddhism or after modernity, why do we still insist on using the word Christian or Buddhist or modernity? I think it points to, to an emerging sensibility in which although we feel we've left something behind, we also recognize that we are still connected to it. Perhaps it's a bit like a snake who, who sloughs off an old skin, but nonetheless continues to be a snake with a new skin. I think it's impossible for us to completely uh, reject or delete from our experience something as, uh, as deeply rooted as our religious faith or tradition or, or our culture. So post-modernity, post-Christianity, post-Buddhism acknowledges, I think, the somewhat ambivalent relationship we have, maybe in some respects a, a sort of a love-hate relationship. We, we, we feel that we've moved beyond and yet we still keep returning will still keep referring to what it is that we have moved beyond. <coughs> a couple of books that have been very helpful to me in thinking through our contemporary religious and spiritual predicament is a book by Don Cupid, the Anglican theologian called After God, and more recently a book by the Italian uh, philosopher uh, Gianni Vattimo called After Christianity. In both cases, um, the authors are trying to find a language to come to terms with this condition that many of us perhaps share. Now, according to um, Gianni Vattimo, Again, I don't know how well he is known in New Zealand. He's an extraordinary figure in a way. He's a, a professional philosopher at the University of Turin. He's a practicing Roman Catholic. And he's also a member of the European Parliament. And I very much respect uh, a person who's able to embrace so much in their lives. For Vatimo and I think this is certainly the case with Don Cupid, and I would share the same view, is that post-Christianity, or post-modernity, or post-Buddhism, refer also to what we call secularity, secularization. The secular comes from the Latin word seculum, which means this age, or this time, perhaps we could say this world, in contrast to how both Christianity and Buddhism have traditionally been taught, namely as, in a way, looking forward to an eternity or nibbana that only really fully comes to be after our life on this earth, after death. For Vatimo, he sees secularization not as the failure of Christianity, but as its triumph. He sees this in terms of the theological idea of the kenosis, or the, the emptying of God, through the death of Christ on the cross, which he understands as a radical affirmation, a giving of oneself, to this world, which, in a sense, is what it is that we're actually experiencing right now. When we sat in meditation, 
and we came to our breath, we came to our bodies, we heard the choir reciting those scales, we returned very much to what is actually unfolding in the here and now. And that, in a sense, is a secular move. My own understanding is that the Buddha too, back in the 5th century BC, also somehow embraced this world in a way that contrasted rather radically with, with how religion was thought of and practiced at his time. The normative religious form in the 5th century BC on the Gangetic plains of India was uh, Brahmanism rather than the Hinduism that came later. But that tradition was very much concerned with turning one's attention inwards in order to recover our sense of our deepest uh, self, our soul, which was believed to coexist or to bring us into communion with Brahman or God. And salvation in the Brahmanic tradition was very much about um, learning to detach oneself from any identification with one's body, with the phenomenal world, with one's thoughts, with one's mind, and return to this primordial, unconditioned, divine essence, so that at death, rather than be reborn, one absorbed into the divine reality itself and partook of its eternity. In the Buddha's teaching, we find a complete reversal of that approach. That when the Buddha presents meditation, he doesn't present it as, a, as an introspective a deepening of our inner experience, but he turns attention to our breathing, to the sensations in our body, to our feelings as they're rising and passing here and now, to the bubbling up of thoughts and emotions, and finally, to an embrace of the totality of our phenomenal experience at any given moment. So we have a movement away from interiority and the quest for eternity and a going out, a reaching out to the world of the senses, the world of others, the world of change, which is also the world of dukkha, of suffering, of tragedy, of loss, of bereavement, of death. And in this sense, I feel that the Buddha too, in a sense, empties out the traditional ideas of self and God and in their place offers a, a perspective, a, a way of life that totally embraces the passing, impermanent, tragic and joyful world of life. 